Well, good morning. It's so good to see you all today. I want to start right into this series. We're going to be talking about conquering fear. I'll tell you about an article I came across a couple of months ago, but it was written back in 1936 by Albert Einstein. And it had one quote in it that really stood out to me, and it was this. We don't know who it was that discovered water, but we do know it wasn't a fish. Now, when you hear that, it just sounds like the silliest thing in the world. But it's actually quite profound, and the point that he was making was actually quite profound. And that is, what he's driving at is that our daily environment is practically invisible to us. A fish exists in water, so it doesn't question its environment. And we're really very much the same way. And this was his point. Our daily reality, our environment, which is comprised of our core assumptions, our expectations, our thinking... Much of that environment is just second nature to us. It's, it's our water. And so we don't think about it. Uh, it surrounds us. It informs our every decision. It's really the thinking beneath our thinking. And because we never examine it, and we never reflect on it, and we never even test it to see if it's actually true, it goes on affecting our lives sometimes in ways we can't even imagine. Our assumptions often are the things that are holding us back. We might have self-limiting or self-defeating beliefs, things like, I'm not enough. I, I, why, why try? Because I'm just going to fail. People can't be trusted, or I don't deserve good things. What I'm saying is, is we rarely think about our thinking, but maybe we should. There's a Bible word in the, in the New Testament. It's the word repentance, and the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. And it literally means to think about our thinking or to change your core assumptions. In other words, God tells us that if you want to change your life, it begins with repentance. You've got to repent. Now, many of us, maybe that word got loaded up with a lot of baggage based on the churches that we grew up in or what we experienced, and repentance sounded like such a bad word. But what I'm here to tell you is at its most fundamental level, you need to hear God saying to change your life you have to question your core assumptions. They have to be rearranged. They have to be reordered according to God's value system. So how does all this work? Well, let me explain. We're at a time of the year where a lot of people make New Year's resolutions. I won't ask this morning if you've made New Year's resolutions because we're pretty divided between people who make them every year and people who refuse to make them every year because you've made them in the past and you've failed at doing it, so you just don't make them anymore. I can relate to this guy, though. I found this tweet this past week. He said, I've taken so many before pictures while telling myself I'm going to start getting into shape. So basically, I have a slideshow of me getting more fat. <laughs> so, so here's the million-dollar question. Why is it that so many of us fail at New Year's resolutions? Could it be that the real reason we fail is not a lack of willpower, but because we've never addressed the bad thinking that led to the undesirable behavior in the first place. You see, this is our problem in a nutshell. When we go about changing our life, many of us try to change it from the outside in. So we change our diet, we change our daily routine, we change our bad habits, and that's great. It gets you so far. But if you're anything like me, you understand that sometimes you may make a change in your life only to find months later you're either back at square one or now you're dealing with an equally bad habit that took that one's place. Could it be the reason we fail is because we focus on the fruit and not the root? We want to focus on the external manifestation of the problem and not address the problematic thinking that led to it in the first place. I like the way Jeanette Corrin said it. She said, change your thoughts, change your life. So in today's message and in the coming weeks, we're going to do just that. We're going to look at the thinking that underlies most of our thinking. We're going to look at some core assumptions, some key expectations, the things that we bring to the table before we even make a decision. And the first one we're going to start off with is a really biggie, and it's fear. The fear of not being enough, the fear of facing life all alone and in my own power, the fear of failure, the fear that God doesn't love me, the fear that the future holds the same disappointments as the past. Fear keeps us from the good life. Fear reflects a basic lack of trust in God, our belief in our limitations, our core assumption that what, looks, that what the future looks like for us looks a lot like the past and everything bad that's been done to us. Fear will make you exaggerate your problems while minimizing the potential. It'll kill your dreams. It'll stop your progress, but it doesn't have to be that way. What I do know is this. 
When fear controls your life, you'll find all kinds of evidence that your fears are warranted and that they're well-grounded. You know why? Because of this first point. We tend to find what we're looking for. Decades of scientific and psychological research have undergirded that one of the most potent things about human personality is our expectations. We tend to see what we want to see. We tend to experience what we expect to experience. Now, when your core assumptions are positive, this can be a really good thing. You find evidence of possibility. You trust God implicitly. You sincerely believe if God is asking you to do something, it must be for your good and your growth. And anything and everything that happens, God is always going to work toward your good and your growth so you feel positive about your future. But if you go through life trying to find insecurity at every turn, you'll accumulate plenty of evidence to make your case. But the other thing you'll do is you'll, look, you'll overlook every exception to the rule. The truth that's staring you in the face, you will not see it because you only find what you're expecting to see. Now, this was fascinating. I came across a study done of radiologists. Now, I don't envy a radiologist at all and the job they have to do to examine these x-ray films in dark rooms, trying to discern signs of disease and abnormalities and determine what they could mean. So this study was done where radiologists were given a piece of of x-ray film and embedded in it was a tiny gorilla. Now, this is the actual film, okay? Minus the circle. I put the circle there so you would see the gorilla. The circle wasn't in there, but this was given to radiologists. I want you to, I want you to ask yourself, how many radiologists do you think noticed that gorilla? Now, they used eye tracking technology and they determined that every single radiologist that looked at that film saw the gorilla. They were looking directly at it. But it was only 17% of them, only three out of 20 radiologists reported as having seen the gorilla, which means that 83% of them, the vast majority, missed it entirely. It was right in front of their eyes, and they didn't see it. Why? Because we tend to find what we're looking for. We see what we expect to see, and we're just like the radiologist. We find evidence of what we're looking for. You know what? If you believe all men cheat, you'll find plenty of evidence that all men cheat. If you think that all pastors are in it for the money, you'll have your proof before very long. You can scan the headlines. You can do your research. You'll find plenty of pastors that are in it for the money. And if you believe in your fears, you'll find all the proof to, to, to show you, to demonstrate unequivocally whatever opportunity you're given to stretch yourself or better yourself, it's full of problems and nothing but downside for you. You and I will always find what we're looking for. So I want to share with you a story from the Bible where the people did just that and missed out on a great future. It had been two years that since the children of Israel had been delivered from Egyptian bondage, 400 years in slavery, and now two years of being in the wilderness heading toward the promised land, and they're now on the cusp of entering the promised land. They are at the gate, if you will, to go in. Now, here's the deal. This is when they face their greatest challenge, and by the way, that typically is the time when we face our greatest challenge. Just before things get good, just before things could significantly shift for us, Right before what could be the most important part of your life, you will sometimes face your greatest challenge. Now, you might relate to this story today because you kind of feel like they did after wandering two years in the wilderness. I don't like being here. And it could be that maybe you're in the wilderness because of a personal problem, an addiction, and you feel like you have lost your way and you don't know the way out. You don't like being in the wilderness. And there are other people here that maybe your marriage is not going to make it to 2021. And you're feeling that right in the pit of your soul in this service right now as I'm speaking. And others of you, it's just been a really tough emotional road because it's been about family. Maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your in-laws, maybe it's your parents. It's been a really difficult journey for you. You've been in the wilderness. And there are others of you that you've lost somebody very dear, somebody very precious to you in death. And you've been grieving. All you know is you don't want to be in the wilderness, but that's where you are, and you're looking for a way out. So this is where this story comes into play. After two years of being in the desert, God has finally brought the Jewish people to Kadesh Barnea, which is the southern gate to the promised land. The Lord told Moses to send 12 of their leaders as spies into the land. After 40 days, they returned to bring back their report. 
They come back bearing pomegranates and figs and a single cluster of grapes so large that it had to be supported on a pole between two men. So the report starts being given, and the first guy starts out and says, it's a magnificent country just like God said. It's fruitful, it's abundant, it flows with milk and honey. Then another guy says, but there are people living there and they're powerful, and they're not going to leave without a fight. And a third one chimes in and says, you know, and that's not going to be easy because their cities are well fortified. And a fourth says, and those guards, well, compared to us, we look like insects and then finally the last one said that's not the worst of it there's more of them than there are of us now i don't know if you're aware of this or not but the word but is the third most used conjunction in the english language now we typically use it all the time but very seldom do we give much thought to it typically when we use the word but what we're doing is negating whatever we said right in front of that now, I'll give you an example of this because sometimes we have creative meetings as pastors and we come together and we're generating ideas and everybody's kind of spitballing, throwing stuff out there. And what happens invariably is this. You know, we're trying to think of doing something new or doing something old in a creative new way. And somebody will say, you know, it's a good idea, but we tried it before and it didn't work. Or, you know, it's really a wonderful idea, but, you know, we don't have the money to do that. Or, yeah, it's a great idea, but you gotta know, it's totally impractical. And all of the energy just drains out of the room, right? If you've ever been in a meeting like that, you know that the word but is a, a possibility killer. And so what we have to do is we've got to learn to substitute the word and for the word but. When you hear a great idea, don't say, oh, you know, it's a great idea, but we don't have the money. Say, hey, that's a great idea, and we're gonna have to figure out where to get the resources. Doesn't that sound completely different? Because you see, negativity feeds our fears, and positivity feeds our faith. Now look at this report, it's summarized in Numbers 13, verses 32 and 33. So the, the majority report of the spies was negative. The land is full of warriors, the people are powerfully built, and we saw some of the Anakim there, descendants of the ancient race of giants. We felt like grasshoppers before them. So if you were to take the time this afternoon and read Numbers 13, what you discover is the first 11 words of the report are positive, and the next 108 words are purely negative. The 10 of the spies could only see the obstacles. They couldn't see a single possibility. They saw what God was placing in front of them, but they could only see the negative because they were looking through the lens of fear. They were finding what they were looking for, proof that this was a bad idea. Now, I don't know if you notice this phrase or not, but it says, we felt like grasshoppers before them. I call this the grasshopper mentality, and it happens all the time. The grasshopper mentality is any time that we allow problems, attitudes, or circumstances to cause us to doubt God and believe that we will lack the resources or the strength to do the things he's telling us to do. Anytime you let your situation dictate to you what's going to happen instead of God and his promises. So when you look at the particulars of this report, you find that the cities are fortified. They're, they're basically inaccessible, according to the report. There's, there's this report of all the enemies that are there, like the Amalekites and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites and probably a few stalagmites and hit, uh, termites, too. You know, just don't know who all's there. But here's what I discovered. The word Hittite comes from a word that means terror. And the word Jebusite comes from a word that means to tread down or to trample. So even the names of these tribes have a sense of foreboding to them, but that's not all. These tribes live in the southern hills of Canaan. Where's Israel right now? Camped out at the southern gate. So these are going to be the first enemies they encounter, and not just that, but they have the advantage of holding the high ground. But there's more to it. Listen to what they say. The land devours its inhabitants, and all the people that we saw there in it are of great height. We saw Nephilim there. Now, the word Nephilim actually goes back to Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. And what the spies are doing is they're creating this image of a demonically empowered giant in order to convince the people it's a bad idea. And they exaggerate. There's no question. They're exaggerating because they compare themselves to insects, to grasshoppers. There is no human being that stands against another human being, no matter how large, that is a grasshopper compared to them. But this is the language of fear. 
I like the way James Montgomery Boyce said it because he perfectly summarized what happens after this report. The entire forward momentum of the story is suddenly placed in jeopardy. The whole expedition begins to unravel. So the report is very negative. It's filled with fear and fear mongering. As a result, you need to understand fear is as contagious as the flu. Have you ever heard of the, uh, of the science documentaries Nova? Uh, they're award-winning. I mean, they're, they're featured a lot on PBS. It's a great series. I've watched many of them myself. Really well-researched. This is why they win so many awards for what they've done. But just a few years ago, probably about two or three years ago now, they did a report and asked the question, is fear contagious? Is fear contagious? In particular, they asked the question, what if diseases aren't the only things that can spread from person to person? And they first began with this example in the animal kingdom, that insects, like ants and bees, secrete what's called an alarm pheromone. So these insects are social creatures. And when one of them encounters a threat, they secrete, they release this alarm pheromone, which alerts the whole colony to impending danger and triggers a collective response. This is why bees swarm. And typically, if you get in a swarm, you don't get stung by one, you get stung by several. This is why when you step on a fire ant mound, you get the whole colony going up your leg, right? To living in Texas, we understand these things. That's the alarm pheromone. Now, you may not be used to thinking of us in this way, but human beings are also social creatures. That we are more connected than just being of the same people or species. And in particular, when we're scared, we too release alarms in our sweat. They're called chemo signals. And they may be just as contagious. Science tells us that the human body gives off a subtle odor. You might smell fear in someone's stink. I mean, I don't know how that affects us, but evidently it can have a trigger effect on people that are in our proximity. But it's not just that. It's also how fear spreads from person to person in other ways. And they gave the example of the Ebola scare. Do you remember this? I mean, it just happened a couple years ago. What happened is, and it was devastating to West Africa, 11,000 people, more than 11,000 people died as a result of the Ebola scare. But the way it was covered in our news, the way information passed on the internet through social media, it ramped up fear. There were protests, there were all kinds of terrible things happening. My daughter is a paramedic, but now she leads North Texas Acadian Ambulance for the entire North Texas region. But at that time, she had to be trained in how to handle Ebola. And I can still remember her in that suit that she had to have on and all the protocols she had to go through. I myself was detained in New York City because coming home on an international flight, I threw up. And I threw up because I have a condition called Meniere's disease. My inner ear will get to spinning and all of a sudden I'm just sick and I throw up. And they take me right off the plane and into this incubation area where I'm with all these other sick people. And I'm just thinking, you put me with all the Ebola people. Why'd you put me in there, right? Because my fears ramped up too. But they keep me in there until a doctor sees me and then I'm interviewed. And then they finally release me just in time to catch my next flight home. I mean, it was really something else. But that's what fear does. Fear causes us... To, 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 to panic, even when there's no warrant for the panic. Well, that same contagion of fear is well documented in the book of Numbers. The Old Testament book of Numbers is all about the challenges of the people of God in the wilderness. By the way, the book of Numbers, the names of the books of the Bible were added later. They were not a part of the original manuscripts. And Numbers is not a good name for this book. The way Jewish people name their books is from the first line of the book, and the first line of this book is in the wilderness, because that's what the book is about. There are challenges in the wilderness, and the issue is, will they trust God? And if you've ever read this book, you know the answer to that question, no, they won't. They won't trust God. Instead, what this book is filled with is griping and complaining and grumbling and people letting their fears get the best of them. So if you ask God the question, is fear contagious? He'd say, read the book of Numbers, you'll know the answer to that question. Negativity and fear spread just like the flu. You can catch it from people you pal around with. This is why community is one of the single most important choices we make in life. A negative, griping group of friends will pull you down to their level in the same way that a positive, affirming group of friends will lift you up to theirs. Choose your community wisely. 
In fact, take a good look at your friends right now. Because look at their life. That's where you're going to be in five years. It will be. We invariably move in the direction of our community. So some of us, we got into our messes by hanging around with the wrong people. I don't know if it's ever occurred to you or not, but you get out of your messes the same way you got into them. You got into them hanging out with the wrong people, you get out of them hanging around with the right people. Maybe it's time for some new friends. You need people who encourage you to be all God meant for you to be. That's what you need. And that's what community does. The best communities bring out the best in us. So what Josh and the Beatles were saying to us early on about connecting to a community, about joining up, about getting to know new people, be with people who are concerned about growing in their spiritual life and will encourage you to do the same. Your friends are the best barometer of where your life is heading. So once we open the door to fear, we will grab onto anything and everything that reinforces our doubts and validates our fears. If you let fear in, you'll accumulate plenty of evidence to support it. So in chapter 14 of Numbers, we're told about the reaction of the people. The whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. So once fear grips their heart, foolishness takes over. Listen to this. Why is the Lord bringing us out into this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Now that their faith has evaporated, they wallow in total negativity, and then that leads to rebellion. They said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Now, when I read this story, I realize the first indication that you and I have turned away from God is grumbling. That we turn away from God, we get focused on our circumstances. Things aren't going our way, and we want to make sure that people know it's not going my way. When I'm focused on my circumstance, by definition, I'm no longer focused on God. I'm focused on what I don't like, and they're already tipping their hat that their orientation is turned away from God. Grumbling is one of the top sins of the Bible. Once people start grumbling, invariably, they put on the rose-colored glasses of nostalgia. I wish it was like it used to be. Do you know there was a time in this country that nostalgia was considered a sign of mental illness? That people would look to their past and try to recreate their past to try to solve problems in the present? It's not a good thing. In fact, it's so not good that King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, wrote about it in the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, say not, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. The book of Ecclesiastes is constantly contrasting the foolish man and the wise man. And what Solomon is saying is when you look to the past as a solution to your present, you're not being very smart. Ultimately, where that leads is back to slavery. The Israelites assumed it would be better for them back in Egypt, but that would lead them right back to Pharaoh and right back to chains. When you live by false assumptions, you become a slave, either to your past or to the what-ifs of life. There's always, there's always people who want to live in the past, and they still do. They prefer predictable misery over the uncertainty of happiness in the future. Here's what I know. When you're afraid, all your decisions are already made for you. They're already made. Now, here's the good news. You and I, biologically speaking, are only born with two fears. Did you know that? The fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Babies have this from, from the womb. Once they come out, Fear of loud noises, fear of falling, that's our fears, which means every other fear is learned. And because every other fear is learned, they can also be unlearned. So here's what we, here's what we know. There were 12 spies, 10 focused on the negative and the fear, two focused on the positive and on faith. Now, we talked about the positive, the, we haven't talked about the positive side of the report yet, but we're going to in just a minute. But here's my question. How could 12 people looking at the same facts come up with such different conclusions. I mean, all 12 of them saw the same thing. They were even in substantial agreement about all the facts. Everyone agreed it was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was abundantly fertile. They also agreed that there were formidable enemies there and fortified cities. But 10 saw problems, two saw opportunities. 10 were fearful and two had faith. I want to learn from the guys who had faith, and that's what this last point is about, the keys to conquering fear. And the first is simply this, remember God is for you. 
You know, the world would have us believe that whatever the human heart can conceive, it can achieve. And what that does is it elevates humankind to the status of God. Human potential, while it's great, is also limited. We can only do so much on our own. So when you look at the story of the spies, Joshua and Caleb stand against the majority report. And in particular, what they want to do is they want to encourage the people to believe. So listen to what they said. It's a wonderful country ahead, and the Lord loves us. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Now pay attention to what they weren't saying. They didn't say, hey guys, sure they're giants, but we can overwhelm them with our numbers, or we're as strong as them, or the bigger they are, the harder they fall. This is not some kind of rah-rah pep talk. This is a talk that's based in reality. They say God is on our side, that's why we'll win, because God never makes a promise he doesn't keep. So Caleb, what he does is he doesn't deny the report of the other spies. He says, yes, our enemies are there. Yes, there's formidable cities, and yes, our adversaries will be great. It's going to be difficult. But in spite of all that, let's get on with it. We're able, with God's help, to do what he told us to do. So if you compare Joshua and Caleb to the other, the thing that stands out to me is this. The grumblers and the complainers, the whiners, what they say is if we go in there, God's going to kill us. And what Caleb and Joshua says, no, God loves us. And that's the key. If you want to be an overcomer, if you want to be victorious, if you want to, as we sang a moment ago, that we are more than conquerors through Christ, if you want to really believe that and live that, then you've got to be certain about God's love for you. Make no mistake about it. The most important thing about you is what you think of when it comes to God. It is the most important thing about you. Anything less than he loves me and that I matter to him is already causing problems in your life. You say, well, Keith, why should I believe God loves me? If he loved me, why wouldn't things be going a lot smoother in my life? Friends, the fact that you have problems proves that you're human and you live in a broken world. That's not evidence that God doesn't love you. If you want evidence that God loves you, stop looking at their circumstances, start looking at the cross. That's your evidence that God loves you. So if you walked into this place and your God image is somehow distorted and you think that God doesn't care about you, that you don't matter to him, that he doesn't love you, then friends, that's where you have to begin. Because believing anything other than that is what's causing your problems right now. The second key to overcoming that comes from Caleb's life is this. Problems don't defeat you. Your perspective does. Now, there's something really essential that you need to understand in this story. If the people of God would not fully and radically trust in God as they entered the promised land, then it would have been a bloodbath for the people of God. God needed people who were radically dependent on him to carry out this plan. And when they wouldn't trust God, God let them live out the remainder of their life in the wilderness. But for the next 40 years, you know what he did? He raised up a generation that would be radically dependent on him. You know how? By making them dependent on him every day for their food and their clothing. Every day. If God didn't provide the food, they wouldn't eat, right? So they had to radically depend on God. And once they were ready, they were ready to enter the the, the promised land. Now, only Joshua and Caleb of that original generation get to go into the promised land because they believed when everyone else wouldn't. Caleb's no longer a young man, but listen to what he says. Today, I'm 85 years old. I'm as strong now as I was when Moses sent us on that journey, and I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. So I'm asking that you give me the hill country that the Lord promised me, you will remember that as spies, we found the Anakim living there in great walled cities. But if the Lord is with me, I'll drive them out of the land. I like Caleb. 85, he's past retirement. I mean, he still feels strong, still feels able-bodied, but you know, Caleb also understands. This is not about Caleb. This is about God. He said, if the Lord is with me, I'll have what he promised. He's trusting that God's going to come through because he believes that God-sized assignments never lack God-sized resources. Here's the thing. In life, a lot of your life is going to be determined by what promises, what reality you believe. Some of you think you're in life all alone. Some of you think because you're in the desert, you've got to get out on your own. Some of you think if you're going to be happy, it's all up to you. And i got to tell you that every time you feel that way, when you encounter an obstacle, you feel like a grasshopper, and your fear often paralyzes you. But if you're trusting God's promises, that you're his beloved child, that he has a sacred purpose for your life, 
then you may still run into giants and you might still be scared from time to time, but your fear is beside the point. Because you see, that problem's not standing in your way, it's standing in God's way, and they don't make giants big enough to get in God's way. If God said it's going to happen, it's going to happen because these is true to his promises. So here's the thing. Because the Hebrews are afraid, they don't trust God. And so God says, okay, you can stay in the desert. I'll bring your children into the land instead. Which means the sad reality is, is God will let you keep wandering in the wilderness as a victim of your fears if that's what you really want. But the kingdom of God's still going to come. If this generation does not rise up to the challenge God lays in front of it, God will wait for the next one. If the Bible teaches us anything at all, God is not in a hurry. God can wait till people will trust him to do what he needs done. But this is your moment and my moment to choose faith. Now, to me, one of the most fascinating stories about the conquest of Canaan is what happens when they finally go in, meet their first adversaries at Jericho, and meet their first Canaanite in a prostitute by the name of Rahab. And when they're talking to Rahab, you know what Rahab says? We've been dreading this day for 40 years. We knew you all were camped out on our border. And we've heard the stories of the exploits of your God. And we were afraid. What? The Canaanites have more faith in Israel's God than Israel does. They're afraid. And they've been afraid for 40 years. You see, God's reputation had already preceded him. And there are a lot of people who are saying, hey, these people are coming, and we know they're coming, and God is on their side. We had better get out of Dodge, which reaffirms that problems never defeat us. It's our perspective that does. What problem are you facing right now? Regardless of the problem you're facing, your problem's not your problem. The problem's the way you see your problem. Do you see your problem with the eyes of faith, or do you see your, your problem through the eyes of fear? The final thing we learned from Caleb, I love this the most, the victory of one winner inspires another. So Caleb wins his mountaintop, and what it says is this. Now the name of Hebron was formerly Kiriath Arba, for Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Then the land had rest from war. What the Bible tells us is that Caleb won his prize. He took the high country. He took Kiriath Arba. He took its capital city, and he renamed it Hebron. That would be this giant slayer's capital city, Hebron. Many years later, there was a young king when, when the, the, the monarchy is established in Israel. First king is Saul. The second king is a young shepherd boy. A young shepherd boy that has to go up against a giant by the name of Goliath with a slingshot and five rocks. Come to find out he only needed one, right? But he takes his rocks, he kills Goliath. And you know what? He decides what will be the capital of Israel And he chooses the city, not of Jerusalem, he chooses Hebron. Why? Well, why would a giant slayer not want to to live anyplace else besides a city that was won by a giant slayer that used to be occupied by giants? What I'm telling you is the story of one winner, the story of one giant slayer, inspires another. And this is so important because, you know, what happens is this, is sometimes we hang around people who are are so full of fear, so full of negativity, so full of complaining and griping that we find ourselves just being pulled down into all of that muck in the mire. If you want your life to go in a different trajectory, then start hanging around with people who believe we can take this mountain. God is on our side. There's nothing that stands in our way because there's nothing that stands in God's way kind of attitude, and you'll find yourself to be in the winner's circle instead of the losers. Everybody's got a giant to face. There's no exceptions to this rule. Your giant may be different from mine, but we've all got one. One psychological study found that 80% of all the messages we hear on a daily basis are failure messages that begin with the words don't, can't, and shouldn't. Now, the Bible gives us the opposite message. It tells us this. Now, your attitudes and thoughts must constantly be changing for the better. Bible encourages us to look at our thinking underneath our thinking. To think about our attitude, our assumptions, our expectations in life. You know, I want to tell you something. There was a time I pastored a tiny church in South Garland, what used to be behind the Hypermart on Kingsley Road, a tiny two-story pink church building. The best attendance we ever had in that building was 75 people, about the size of this section way over on the far side. 
About 75 people who would show up Sunday morning, Sunday night, come for Wednesday night prayer meeting, all that. And I did that for four and a half years in South Garland. And I had never been a part of a big church, let alone led a big church. But I went to Southern California, and I met a giant slayer, and his name was Rick Warren. And he asked a question. He said, what would you attempt for God if you knew you couldn't fail? And the moment he said that, in my heart, I thought, I'd start a church. I start a church like I think church ought to be. And you know what? Then he said this, and this whole sermon was based on this passage I'm sharing with you right now. If God wants it done, you can't fail at it. So I said, okay, we're going to do this thing. And so Spring Creek Church exists because I found somebody I could relate to. He seems like this is an average, relatable guy. And he said, if God wants it done, nobody can stop it. And so we did it. And God did it. And you know what? Some of you in this room, we're starting at the first of the year, and you're coming to terms with the fact that you really do have an addiction. Maybe it's drugs, maybe it's alcohol, maybe it's something that's just getting the better of you, and you just can't seem to ever break free. Let me tell you something. You're already in this room seated among giant slayers. There are people in this room right now, and they would willingly tell you, I've got a year, I've got two years, I've got 10 years, I've got 20 years of sobriety from alcohol. And you know what? You start hanging around with other giant slayers, you're going to learn how to beat that giant. And every one of them will tell you, I didn't do it on my own. I did it because I trusted in God. I trusted in a power greater than myself, and that power set me free. And you know, there are people in this room that you grew up in a really toxic form of Christianity. And that toxic form of Christianity loaded you up with all kinds of guilt and shame. And it seems that no matter how hard you try, you're always beating yourself up. Nobody can beat you up better than you can. And you do that to yourself all the time. But here's the thing. You've never hung around with a giant slayer. And there are people in this room who've learned how to get free from the toxic effects of shame and guilt. And you need to raise your level of friendship and be with another giant slayer so that you can know what it's like to defeat your giant. There are people who've changed their life. There's all kinds of giants that have been slain in this room. And you need to friend these people. That's what community is all about. Community is all about the relationships that we have. Because every relationship you have right now either feeds your fear or feeds your faith. And there is no in-between. So which choices are you going to make for the new year? It's not just about, hey, I want to change this. I want to do this. I want to do that. You know, that's all well and good. We got to get down to the things that really make us successful. And what makes us successful are the quality of relationships that we have, the community that we tie our lives to, that are going in the direction we want to go. Nobody in this room is perfect. Nobody has all the answers, including myself. But I can tell you this. There are plenty of people in this room who know the way, who go the way, and are more than willing to show you the way. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for what you're doing in this room, in this place, in this city, in our homes, around the country. I thank you, God, that you have not stopped working, that you're still about this business of bringing about your kingdom. And I pray right now for every soul in this room, whatever giant it is, whatever problem they've walked into these doors carrying, whether it's about a relationship, whether it's personal, whether it's an addiction, whether it's about loss, no matter what it is, that they would come to understand that nobody succeeds by themselves. That we need one another. That, Lord, we need to first understand more than anything that you love us, that you're for us. That that's a core belief that we have to come to terms with who you are and how you relate to us. And God, help us to understand that our problem is not really the problem. The problem is the way we're seeing our problem right now. And more than anything, God, help us to understand that right now, in our life, you've already orchestrated a lot of people to surround us who are giant slayers. Help us to lean into those relationships and ask the questions, how did you get to where you are? How did you learn to trust in this way? How did you overcome? What are the keys to doing this? Help us, God, to lean into that and to know that your wisdom exists in the body of Christ. We thank you, God, for what you're going to continue to do in our lives and in this year. In Jesus' name, amen.